This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. It's the Hindsight 20 Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Mallory. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening. As always, brought to you by the Detroit Sports Podcast. We have plenty to talk about on today's show. Not as much groundbreaking news. I mean, the last few weeks, it was like news event after news event, you know, firings, hirings, Calvin, mulling, all of those things. We had a moment uh, this week to kind of sit back and digest some of those things. So we're going to do just that on today's show. We'll be talking about Bob Quinn. And there are subtle changes that he has been making, but why I think these kind of play into a cultural change that we'll see with the Detroit Lions. So we'll talk about that. We had a pretty good question asking about the biggest need for the Lions. Well, it's hard to answer it, but we'll try our best. Also, um, looking at one thing that Bob Quinn, our GM, mentioned, that being depth, it's a very important aspect of the game, something that the Lions don't have a ton of under his estimation. So we'll look at just that. Uh, The position with the most depth as opposed to the position with the least amount of depth. The Senior Bowl is coming up. We'll be talking about a couple of players to look out for. And we have a new segment that we'll be introducing in honor of the show being called Hindsight 20. We're going to give you a hindsight moment. In, In actuality, what it is, it's a chance for the Lions to pull a mulligan. And there are so many instances for every team in which they'd like to pull one. We'll give you one that happened, no, not in 2014's draft, because we always say Aaron Donald for Eric Ebron. No, we're not going there. We're going to give you one of those moments for the 2015 draft, a hindsight moment, changing things if we have the opportunity to do so. So before we get any further, DetroitSportsPodcast.com is where we can be found. It's the best of the best. Doc and Jock, you constantly have the uh, Jock John Macaroon, Doc, excuse me, uh, John Macaroon uh, with the one on one segments that are always awesome. Check those out. You've got Fantasy Geeks, you got Tiger Talks. Things are heating up with the Tigers. They just signed Justin Upton. And before you know it, the season will be here. You know, spring training is, you know, about a month away. So uh, plenty to look forward to and listen to right here on Detroit Sports Podcast Network with Tigers Talk, et cetera, et cetera. The whole cast and crew is right here. If you got iPhones, Go to iTunes and subscribe. If you are an Android person like myself, go ahead, get the Podbay app, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Because when you do, this gives you an opportunity to be linked in at all points, at all times. Whenever we have something new popping up, you will be right there to enjoy it. So let's get into this whole Bob Quinn slight change, cultural change, the things that I am uh, sensing from him. Uh, To start off, we see that uh, he had made some moves. Uh, The first one that we saw earlier in the week was the changing of our strength and conditioning. A good portion of these guys getting fired. Jason Arapoff, if I'm saying that right, Ted Rath. Okay, I could sit here and act like, oh, yeah, oh, man, they let go of those guys. I know who they are. Most of us don't know who they are. We do know that they were the strength and conditioning guys, and so uh, they're gone. Uh, It's hard to really say. I mean, I was looking at this and thinking about this thing. Someone asked me, what did I feel or how did I feel about it? From a standpoint of the Lions, you know, as far as injuries, it's the NFL. Teams and players suffer from injuries time in and time out. I don't think the Lions have gone through anything extraordinary. You can look at some of their recoveries. Uh, Two notable guys that coming off of ACLs, and this happens with a lot of players, but um, Steven Tulloch and then Adrian Waddle, you know, where they rushed back. Because when they came back, they they just looked pretty bad. Adrian Waddle is one guy you look at. You ask yourself, either he was rushed back or the the strengthening process, the recovery process was just not there. Stephen Tullock's old. And so you get an ACL on the wrong side of 30. Trust me, I know (laughs) as a 31-year-old that just suffered a torn ACL a few months ago, I can tell you for sure, and these are fine-tuned athletes, but still applies, on the wrong side of 30 with an ACL tear, it's just going to be rough for you. And I think that's the case with Stephen Tullock. But another guy you have to question is DeAndre Levy. You know, we we saw the the hip injury, mysterious. Was it from Chile and some type of parasite? We don't know. 
But when he came back, he played a couple of snaps and he was shut down. Is it ineffective training? Is it, I'm not going to sit here and, and pretend like the ins and outs of their injuries and the recoveries I know about. But those are two things that stick to my mind. You know, the way I look at it, Quinn's looking at these guys and he has some guys in mind that he wants to bring in and he's slowly building and molding his team. Now, something that's more notable is Cedric Saunders. He was the VP of football operations. Again, this is the type of guy, VP of football operations is kind of like, uh, you know, the secretary of the team, for lack of a better word. He's been there for quite some time. This is someone that will do the, uh, make sure the travel, the equipment, um, you know, there's a number of things depending on each team in which uh, the football operations guy will do. Well, he's gone. So those two things kind of say, hey, you know, Quinn's making his mark. We already know O'Brien came in last week. He's going to be the right-hand man of Quinn. What I really liked, though, was uh, an article that just came out this morning. Private Detroit talked about it, Jeff Reisden. Um, The approach that the Lions uh, took with the East-West Shrine game. Now, when many people look at the Shrine game, it's, uh, it's second to the Senior Bowl. Some people don't even value the Senior Bowl as much because the best of the best usually don't play in it, the Shrine game even more so. But at the end of the day, these are still, you know, potential draftees. These are players that you look at. Maybe some of them will be closer in the later rounds, undrafted free agents, et cetera, et cetera. The point that I want to make, though, is the, the process, as it were. And that was what Quinn always talked about. Follow the process, follow the process. He was the equivalent of Sheldon White talking about grinding. Remember that? Everything Sheldon White said when he was the interim GM, we're grinding, we're going to grind, we've got to grind. Other than him talking about the the biggest direction he got from Martha Ford, he was also talking about grinding. Well, the process is something that we heard from Bob Quinn time in and time out. Well, it seems as though, based on this article, and you can check it out, I believe it's on Sideline Report, was how the process is different now for the Detroit Lions and the way that they scout, the way they they approach these guys, the number of questions that they ask. I mean, everything seems to be more thorough. That's the word that was kind of like the buzz phrase. It was following the process and being more thorough. And that's something that you like to hear. Now, this does not always equate to success, you know, but, (laughs) I mean, you Let's look at these four teams that's playing today. You've got the Carolina Panthers, who, uh, as I'm recording right now, are up by by about 20 points on the Arizona Cardinals. New England, Denver, Carolina, Arizona. I'm going to tell you this much. Being thorough does not automatically mean you will be good at scouting good at a GM. However, there is not a good organization. There is not a good GM or group of scouts who are not thorough. It is something that you must have. Now, Mayhew and company had their own way of doing things. I'm not saying that they weren't thorough at all, but it definitely seems like as a, you know, as an early indicator, Bob Quinn and his staff are taking a longer look at these potential prospects. Now, we already know how, I hate to mention how Matt Millen did things, barely even in Detroit for most of the week, flying back and forth from Pennsylvania. uh, Mayhew definitely seemed more interested, more committed, and the process was stronger. We're just hoping that Bob Quinn takes it to the next step, the next level. And for me, the biggest thing with Mayhew was just the lack of foresight, man. You know, time in and time out, you know, you have a team that goes 10 and 6, but, you know, there's some aging players. You don't see a need to replace them. You don't see a need or any sense of urgency. You've got a defensive tackle situation to where Sue is an impending free agent. You decided not to re-up with Fairley, so he's an impending free agent. You know one of them, one if not both will probably be gone from your team, and you have Aaron Donald sitting right there, and you don't draft him. This past season, you know, you go 11-5, and five, things look good, you know, you're losing, you know, Sue and Fairley on the defense, but you had a guy like James Ahedable playing way over his head, but you don't look to really, you know, change up anything there. Or, or Rasheen Mathis, who's, you know, the dude is old, but you keep putting him out there. It's the lack of foresight, and I think lack of foresight – it kind of ties into a lack of preparedness. And um, this is what we hope to see a different in terms of Bob Quinn, someone that just, just based off the East West shrine game. And this is not where you're going to get your, you know, top 10 picks. If they're that thorough and you can read the article, it was mentioned on private choice, Twitter. Um, I forgive me if I'm wrong. I believe it was Jeff Risden, uh, Risden from the sideline reporter that, that posted it. 
if you're this thorough for the East West Shrine game, asking these guys tons of questions, the number of scouts, the number of Lions personnel you bring in, you can only imagine what they're going to bring to the table when it's the Senior Bowl this upcoming Saturday. Take that a step further for the combine and looking at the film and the tape. I mean, they're going all out just for, you know, the East West Shrine. So it's uh, it's really promising to see them put forth that effort and to give that much attention to detail for what seems to be, you know, a um, I'm not, not going to say a meaningless game, but in, in the hierarchy of evaluating people and the quality that you're getting, the Shrine game is a little bit down there. So it's good to see that they're bringing that to the table already. Also from the article, what we gathered was they want intelligent players, not just playmakers. They want guys who are smart on and off the field. It's hard to separate the two, okay? If you have a guy who is smart and heady, more often than not, they will be smart and heady when it's important, when it's third and 10, when it's you know a crucial situation and you don't want to uh, get a boneheaded penalty, someone that's not going to be a high risk of game suspensions because of bad hits, okay? Look at the Cincinnati Bengals. Give you no further evidence, a team that, you know, they're very talented, I'm not going to say they could be playing today, but they definitely would have played last week if it weren't for boneheaded plays. And the thing that's so crucial, you can have a guy, okay, like a Vontaze Burfick and an Adam Pac-Man Jones that, you know, they do so much for you. They're so talented, but at any moment, they can cost you so much. And that's what happened with, okay, super talented guys, but, you know, they're, they're not smart from that standpoint. I'm not talking about book smart, and I don't know what they're, you know, aptitude is on mathematics or on physics, but, you know, smartness is a package. It's book smarts, it's common sense, it's, you know, the ability to behave as an adult, as a professional. And we know from their past experience that they have failed with that. And, um, you know, Bob Quinn supposedly is looking for guys that are smart. Now, I will say this, though, you know, Jim Caldwell, and he's been a proponent of wanting the good guys, guys that have a strong background, you know, Amir Abdullah, Lake and Thompson fit that mold. You're not going to have all, you know, Harvard and Ivy League graduate candidates, okay? You're not going to have all guys that speak perfect English and that are Nobel laureates and scholars and rogue scholars, okay? That's not going to happen. And I'm not disrespecting anybody from our team. We've got some really good players on our squad. Maybe the they aren't the most uh, worldly or the most well, uh, well-written or well-spoken, well-read, okay? So you have to keep that in mind, too. It's all about balance. And, and I, I carry this thing with life, okay? You know, if you ask my wife, hey, what's, what's, what's one of Jerry's favorite terms? It's all about balance, man. And so I've never seen a team that won a Super Bowl and it was 53 good guys and it was 53 Ivy League guys, you know? So you're going to have guys with varying levels, but putting an emphasis on intelligence, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. If the mask makeup of your team primarily is that way, then great. But if you got a guy that, you know, can run fast enough and jump high enough and he's smart enough for football and you think you can contain him, you know, I'm not saying to take a risk on a Pac-Man type player, but, you know, everyone's not going to be a super genius. Everyone's not going to be well-read. Some of these guys, you know, are going to have deficiencies. You know, some of them not going to be the most upright citizens. You know, we want Super Bowls and let's just be realistic. Sometimes you have to make those sacrifices. You're not always getting you know, Boy Scouts on your team. So I hope Bob Quinn operates with balance. I hope he realizes that, yes, we want smarts. We want a certain type of player, but you can't pigeonhole yourself that completely and start passing up on guys that can help you win and help you win immediately. And so I just like how he's shaping this team in his mold. You know, he's coming out here. He's identifying what he's want. He's being precise. He's being straightforward from all accounts. Uh, O'Brien is the same way, his right-hand man. And so it's promising. And so uh, one of the things that he mentioned was the depth um, with the Detroit Lions. He really liked some of the top guys. And we know that, you know, Ziggy Ansah. These are these players stand out and they pop, okay? These would be good players on any team. DeAndre Levy, Matt Stafford, Golden Tate. These are really good players. Darius Slay, but it's the depth. You know, after those guys, you know, if Ezekiel Ansah goes down, then what? When Darius Slay goes down, not when, excuse me, when uh, DeAndre Levy goes down like he did this year, what do you have behind him? If a Darius Slay were to go down, what do you have? 
And so the depth will be something that this team will be looking to improve, which every team does. I mean, granted, Martin Mayhew wanted to improve depth as well, okay? Let's not sit here and say he was just trying to find the best 22 players and left it alone. But the fact that Quinn mentioned that in his opening press conference when he was introduced to the city of Detroit, to me, says a lot about how he plans on operating. So with that in mind, what I want to look at at this time is our depth. I want to look at the the unit with the most depth and then the unit with the least amount of depth. Um, And so we'll start off with the one with the most depth. Most depth. That sounds like the rapper most depth. Um, We're going to start off with the uh, unit with the most depth. It's the running back spot. Quite simply, we have several guys at this spot that, um, you know, starter quality. Amir Abdullah in his first year did some some pretty good things. Joyke Bell went healthy. You know, he's starter capable. We already know what Theo Reddick can do. He might be the most dynamic out of all of them. Certainly one of, if not the best receiving running back in the NFL. You know, always, you know, catching the ball, running good routes, and always making someone miss. And let's not forget the younger guys. You know, George Wynn has come in and provided a spark for us. If he'll be on the team this year or not, we don't know. He's flirted with the practice squad, and um, he's flirted with actually being on the roster. I even think he started a couple of years ago. Uh, when we had some injuries, and then there's Zach Zinner. Remember Zach Zinner, everyone, everyone's favorite running back, the white running back. You know, we we like these type of little uh, positions and different things, and seeing you know the, the workhorse type guy. He was from what South Dakota State, but he he looked good. And in the preseason, you know, after Amir Abdullah, he he looked great in terms of running backs. Got hurt early in the year, but um, I I think that he will still be a part of the plans for the Detroit Lions. And so I look at depth like this in this terms, in these terms. If the next guy up can kind of hold a torch to the guy you're losing, then you have pretty good depth. Coming into next year, you have to assume that Amir Abdullah will be your starting running back. If he goes down, what's after him? Joyke Bell, well, we don't know if he's staying or not. I really do think he'll be cut but as of right now, he's on the team, so you have to add him. So Joyke Bell coming in would definitely be someone you still feel comfortable with. But even if he's not here, Theo Reddick, now Theo Reddick definitely has to improve in running with the football. I mean, he's a great receiver, but there's more to it, and uh, we want to see more from him. But him being on the field, as always, is as a weapon is something that you appreciate. And then, like I said, Zach Zinner has showed flashes, and even George Wynn. I'm not saying we don't have to address running back at all. You know, if we cut Joyke Bell... I would like to see us uh, draft a running back um, at some point that can be kind of that thunder to Amir Abdullah's lightning. You know, this could be a three-headed monster. The receiving threat, the uh, the space and make a miss juke guy in Amir Abdullah, the receiving threat would be theoretic, and then you have the thunder. You know, we don't have to go as early as Derrick Henry in the second round, but there may be a guy or two later on who I'll talk about that could fit that mold. And all the, I will say this position has a considerable amount of depth. Now, what's the position with the least depth? You would think I would say offensive line. And, you know, granted, it it, it is up there. Um, Both lines, offensive and defensive, are going to have to add some players. But I'm going to say right now it's the quarterback spot because if Stafford goes down, well, as of right now, there's really nothing behind him. Dan Orlovsky's a free agent. But even rewinding the clock back to last year, if Stafford goes down and Orlovsky's in, it's ugly, man. I mean, your season, your chances of winning, I know 7-9 and nine is nothing to write home about, but trust me, uh, Dan Orlovsky in there, and bye, bye, bye. you say that to your season, bye, bye, bye. you say that to your chances of receivers having a productive you know, game, bye, bye, you say that to your optimism, okay? Um, so there's been nothing behind staff, nothing that's a big issue. When you got teams like, the Arizona Cardinals, you know, not just with Carson Palmer, but they're always looking at options. You know, they had Drew Stanton in there. Um, you know, most of these teams will have someone at least serviceable, even with Andrew Luck, who's younger than Stafford, um, having a decent backup in Hasselback, although older, or someone like Aaron Rodgers, who on paper is better than Matt Stafford by all accounts, still having the need or seeing you know, the importance of drafting the guy as they did with Brett Hundley last year. I think that's a big mistake by the Mayhew regime that they had a, just a horrible backup option after Sean Hill left. Now, Sean Hill was a decent backup, but I, I'm going to say almost every NFL team has either 
uh, behind their main quarterback, a young guy that's been drafted in the last two or three years, or a serviceable backup. Some teams have both. Some teams have a serviceable backup and a young guy. Sometimes that young guy is the serviceable backup. The Lions didn't have neither, okay? We didn't have the young guy. You can talk about Kellen Moore all you want. Well, first off, we let him go, so you can you know, nix that. And he just, he just never had the arm strength, man. The guy has a noodle arm. He has no accuracy. I'm, I'm willing to guess if me and him lined up at the 10-yard line, okay, he throw the ball farther than me. But he throw it farther than me, and the margin of victory for him would be less than any other quarterback, okay? The guy does not have a, a cannon for an arm, to say the least. And it's not just throwing it, you know, 40, 50 yards. It's, you know, putting that zip on the ball, getting it into tight spots just isn't there for him. So we've never had the young guy and the serviceable backup we haven't had since Sean Hill left. So I'm thinking that Bob Quinn is going to do something about that. I'm predicting that, first off, we will be bringing in a backup quarterback uh, that would be a little bit more serviceable than Dan Orlovsky. I'm going to give you two guys to consider, and I think we'll be drafting one. Now, how early? I don't think that early. Probably, you know, sixth, seventh round, maybe even fifth round. See how things go. Um, But it's someone that you could potentially groom, and you can look at it, and you can say, hey, you know, Maybe just maybe we can groom him to be a trade piece, to be the backup, or hey, even better, it's all up to him on how he matures. So I'm not going to get into quarterback options. I'll save that for another show, but I will talk about a few guys to consider um, if we're looking at backup quarterbacks next year. Dan Orlovsky, you know, you were part of the 0-16 regime, and you've been a part of our team the last couple of years. You know, nothing against you, but you've got to go. Now, you know, you look at free agent quarterbacks, you have to be realistic. You know, some guys that are available to be signed, they want to start. Like a Sam Bradford will probably be signing somewhere else to be a starter. Now, if he doesn't, yeah, you're paying a, a pretty penny for him to be the backup. Two guys that I want to talk about and consider. Uh, one is Drew Stanton. And yes, you Michigan State fans remember Drew. It was supposed to be a beautiful thing. Calvin Johnson in the first round, Drew Stanton in the second round. It never happened. He... He played here for a little bit, had a cup of coffee. He's done some things over with the Arizona Cardinals. I mean, for a backup, he's serviceable. And he adds a little added element. He doesn't move like he used to. He's getting a little older, okay? He used to have the wheels, but he can move around the pocket a little bit. A little bit of escapability left. And uh, this is the type of guy that you would bring in. And, you know, maybe he can rally a couple of wins. He did it just last year. You know, when Carson Palmer were going through those injuries, you know, they didn't play as good with Drew Stanton in there, but... They were able to get some wins. They beat a playoff team in the Detroit Lions with Drew Stanton as your quarterback. This is someone that I think would be much more suited in the event that Stafford cannot play a game. If he gets hurt mid-game, come in, and maybe he can hold the fort down. Uh, I'd feel a lot more comfortable with him in any event than I would with a guy like Dan Orlovsky. The next guy also has Lions history. It's Thad Lewis, a little bit younger. Uh, He was with the Buffalo Bills. Looked really good. It came down to... Uh, the team choosing between Thad Lewis and Kellen Moore, they went with Kellen Moore. They let Thad Lewis walk. He went to Buffalo at some point. You know, they were saying, man, he might be in the mix, you know, over EJ Manuel. Well, none of that happened. Tyrod Taylor ended up having a really good year, and he's entrenched there. But I think Thad Lewis does have the skill and ability. We saw him in some preseason games, and he looked pretty good. I think he is capable of being a backup somewhere. Why not here? Bringing him back, a system, or or not so much a system because the coaching and philosophies has changed, but uh, a place he's used to, players he's used to, a few coaches still sticking around. And uh, again, I think this will be an upgrade because he does add the element. He can move a little bit. Both of these guys, I'm saying, hey, I'm calling them up. I'm not calling Orlovsky because I want to bring a serviceable backup that can maybe hold the fort down and then a young guy that I'm drafting hopefully with the intent of grooming. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about the Senior Bowl, a few guys to look out for. Um, We kind of predicted something on the last podcast, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, and then we'll end it with the new segment. It's called The Hindsight Moment, so stay right here on The Hindsight 20 Podcast. Jerry Maller here for The Hindsight 20 Podcast. Your ad can be placed right here. The best businesses link up with Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Our listeners like what we tell them about your company. They come, they spend money. It's a beautiful relationship. Let's make it happen. Hindsight 20 podcast at gmail.com.
All right, we're back on the hindsight 20 when we last left. We talked about a little prediction that I made. I was just talking about something in general, and sure enough, it came true this past week. And um, we were talking about, you know, uh, the Rooney rule, and we were talking about, because MLK Day was right there, you know, if it's necessary. And my whole spiel is equality. You know, just the best candidate should win out. And I do want to see more minorities uh, put in a spot where they have an opportunity to succeed or fail, et cetera, et cetera. You know, no handouts, nothing given to you just because you're a minority, but given a fair shake. And then the last thing I mentioned, though, was talking about um, in terms of females. I said, that's another thing inside of football that I, I thought was far off. But I said, at the same time, that's another aspect that we will have to consider. It's not just equality for those of different um, nationalities, but gender equality as well. Well, sure enough, Rex Ryan, maybe he listened to the Hindsight 20 podcast. If you are, how's it going, Rex? Uh, You know, we plan on um, playing you in the preseason as we do every year of the Buffalo Bills and getting a win. But seriously, you know, he brings in Catherine Smith to be the first assistant head coach as a female the first female assistant head coach in the NFL, you know, kudos. Um, I don't know much about her. I don't know her credentials, so I can't speak on what I think she'll become. Uh, It's a proactive move. We've seen it in the uh, NBA. Becky Hammond is an assistant with the San Antonio Spurs. Now, this, uh, th- this has been brought on by mostly support. There was one guy out of Cleveland, I forget his name, and he was saying how, well, you know, she's never played football, which is kind of invalid because there are several NFL coaches and assistant coaches that's never played. I get it, it's better off if you have in, in a lot of ways. But then she said, well, you know, she just can't relate to the physicality. You know, it's something a woman will never be able to do. Well, you know, you look at Jim Schwartz, can he really relate to the physicality of Indomitian Sue or Ziggy Ansah? No, never could and never will. Um, you know, some of these guys are bigger and, and at one time, but there's plenty of coaches you can look. Marty Morningwig, okay? Can he really relate to the speed of Oz Ahir Hakeem, who's a playmaker? That was Morningwig that talked about him, wasn't it? No, he can't. So the relatability thing, because she's a girl, it doesn't really apply. There's plenty of guys, coordinators. Um, you know, you think Charlie Weiss can relate to his team when he's talking about being healthy and eating right? No, uh, coaching is the ultimate don't do as I do, do as I say, because these coaches can't do it. If they could, they would be doing it. So even if they did it at one time, they currently are unable to do it. And so the, the it, it kind of weakens your argument because, yeah, some of these former players been there, done that, but they, they're not currently doing it. So the player can look at you from that standpoint. Hey, you're telling me to be more physical and to take this guy and do this, but you can't do it now, okay? So there aren't a ton of coaches that could currently, you know, m- maybe Dan Campbell. That guy looks jacked. He still looks good. Like he can, like seriously, Dan Campbell, if he gets a coaching gig again, like a head coaching gig, he's one of the few guys that would be a head coach. I said, you know what? He probably could put the helmet and the pads on right now and do some damage. But aside from him, seriously, you know, it isn't about male or female. The coaches can't do what the players can do. Maybe at one time they could, maybe some of them never could. So the whole female being unable theory to me was a little bit weak. Um, Congratulations to Miss Smith, you know, Rex Ryan being proactive, you know, uh, it just takes one time, takes one person to blaze the trail And um, if she's good, she stays. If she's bad, if she's bad, she's gone. You know, she should be fired. It's no special treatment, um, but given the opportunity, uh, it's pretty cool. All right, moving on, let's talk about the Senior Bowl. The Senior Bowl is coming up this Saturday, January 30th, uh, from Mobile, Alabama, as it always takes place. And um, who are some guys that the Lions could be targeting? You know, a lot of guys don't accept invites to the Senior Bowl, but some do. Ziggy Ansah was one of those guys, and, well, we saw how that panned out. There are quality individuals in the Senior Bowl. It's not always going to be the top quarterbacks. A lot of times they sit it out. But we have a few guys that could fill holes for us, positions that we want to look at. I'll start with someone that's going to be considered on day one, then a day two option, and then we'll end it on day three. Day one is Taylor Decker. This is the big man from Ohio State University, six foot seven, three hundred and fifteen pounds. Alex Reno just put up a really good piece this past week on Mr. Taylor Decker, uh, the offensive tackle from the Ohio State University, Mr. Buckeye. 
Um, you want to read that, go to privatetroit.com and it will be there. Uh, we've seen him play, right? You know, Big Ten guy, so we see him against Michigan. We see him against Michigan State. But if you follow some of the Big Ten, this guy is big. He's physical. And um, I like his footwork. I don't think it's the best. I actually do think uh, it can improve and it will improve. Some people think that um, he's better suited as a right tackle. I think he can play left. And he's one of those players that, you know, some people develop better or they, they get better in their pro career than in college. Like, for instance, J.J. Watt, real good in college, but at the pro level, I mean, come on, he was great. I'm not saying Taylor Decker will be that good. I do think the size and physicality will spell out him having a better pro career than perhaps uh, he did in college. And this is someone that you want to look at at the Senior Bowl, taking a look, seeing how he's handling things, looking at the practice, how is he dealing with, you know, the the edge rushers or guys coming in on blitzes because he could very well be the pick for the Detroit Lions uh, when number 16 is coming around. Next up is a guy that will be considered on day two. Defensive tackle is a need for us, and so Austin Johnson will fill that need. Now, this guy is big. He's a run stuffer. He's from Penn State, six foot three, two hundred. Huh, yeah, no, no, not two hundred, three hundred and twenty-five pounds. Now, he's primarily known as a run stuffer. That was like for the first couple of seasons, kind of his bread and butter. Well, guess what? He had six and a half sacks last year, and. He would definitely fill a position. You know, he could be around two guy, maybe around three. I would like him more so around three based on how I kind of look at him and grade him. I've seen him play a few times. He is very disruptive. He has some size and some power. And depending on what happened with uh, with Haloti Nada, this is someone that could fill a similar role. You're primarily bringing him in to stuff a hole. You're primarily bringing him in to be that guy that's the big body. But he can also do some three technique. He has a lot to his disposal. And uh, again, he'll be playing this Saturday. So keep an eye out for defensive tackle Austin Johnson. The third guy, someone that we may want to consider on day three later round, is running back Jonathan Williams from Arkansas. Now, you didn't see much of him this year on the field. He had a foot injury. It put him down and out for four to five months. Well, he's recovered a little bit, and he's ready to go. I'm really looking forward to seeing what he does at the Senior Bowl because the year before, he played quite well for Arkansas, getting 1,190 yards, 12 touchdowns, um, six foot tall, uh, about, I don't have it written down here, but from my memory, he's six foot tall, approximately 210 pounds, has decent speed, but he has some good size as well. Like I said, I think Joyke Bell is going to be on the outside looking in. I think he's someone that will be cut by the Detroit Lions, which means we need someone else, a bigger back with a little bit of size, and Jonathan Williams gives you that. If it was not for the injury, I think he would have had another successful year and he would have been picked a lot sooner. Well, hey, he got the bad foot injury. I think he slips down to day three. I would love for the Lions to pounce on him and bring him in in the event that a guy like Joyke Bell is no longer on our team. Now, we had uh, a pretty good question here on Twitter, and uh, it talked about pretty much the spot that is of most uh, dire need for the Detroit Lions, for lack of a better word. Now, um, there's a lot of needs, and this was posted by J Dog Buster, Jeremy Lions fan, and he basically wanted to know, hey, what position do we need to upgrade the most? What position would you say is the weakest? You know, what's the biggest need for the next off season? And there's a lot. I think offensive and defensive line are pretty big, especially with the uncertainty of a Haloti Nada. Haloti Nada wants to come back. He's saying that, but what's the price tag going to be? How much do we have to consider, you know, the, the, the first half of the year where he struggled against the second half where he looked better? Uh, Tyron Walker injured early on. Will he do another short-term show-me type deal? There's so much to consider. Gabe Wright, unknown. Karan Reed did look pretty good in spots as a young guy last year. But, yes, offensive tackle would still be the biggest need for this team. It's the weakest unit. Um, we need um, uh, a tackle or two. You know, I'm hoping that we sign a free agent and we draft one. This gives us flexibility. We really tried to address the inside this year by bringing in Manny Ramirez and drafting Lake and Tomlinson. I mean, it was met with mixed results. Um, Tomlinson didn't light the world on fire as quick as we wanted him to. Swanson in the middle, who was drafted the year before, 
You know, we find out that it was a shoulder injury. Was that that was keeping him back? Is he just not going to quite be up to par? We have to wait and see. Uh, we'll examine him his second year as a starter. But they did try to address it early and often, and um, it was mixed results. We want them to address tackle early and often as well, trading for a veteran, signing a veteran, and bringing in a young guy to draft. So good question there, Jeremy. Thanks for asking it. It's now time for the new segment as we get out of here. It's called the hindsight moment. I've done videos before where it's called the mulligan moment. It's, you know, it happens for every team, even the good teams, even the teams that are heading to the Super Bowl, um, those that win divisions. There's always a moment where you want to redo. Well, every now and then, especially since this show is called Hindsight 20, of course, I know hindsight is always 20. We will still talk about the moment in Lions history, whether it was a player acquisition, a trade, a cut, etc., in which... Man, instead of going this way, they could have went the other way. So I'll take you back to the 2015 draft. And yes, offensive tackle was something we were addressing. The interior was an emphasis. We wanted to make sure we got that all shored up. And so, yes, Lakin Tomlinson was drafted. Manny Ramirez was traded for. That's all fine and dandy. In the seventh round, Corey Robinson, a tackle, was taken. Now, the hindsight moment, and every team did this. Because Leo Collins, there were issues and concerns about, you know, a murder. Then once he got cleared, he made it very abundant, saying, I'm not going to play for you if you draft me past a certain round. There's money and contract situations involved. He wants to be an undrafted free agent. Well, um, whether he was calling everyone's bluff, whether he was being truthful or not, we don't know. So after the uh, Dallas Cowboys picked him up, his agent said, well, you know what? You know, no matter where he was drafted. Um, we would have went ahead and played and did what we had to do. You know, he wasn't going to sit out a whole nother year and, you know, let time get the best of him and who knows how he would have panned out. Well, in the seventh round, my hindsight moment is take the chance on Leo Collins. It's a seventh round pick. If he refuses to play for you, you've given up and lost a seventh round player. It's not like Corey Robinson lit the world on fire. I don't know what he'll become. I don't know for sure. Leo Collins has looked pretty good so far. Starting, what, 10 games for the Cowboys. He has the ability to play the inside, and he already looks like a pretty solid right tackle option. If it wasn't for all the hoopla, the circumstances, and just what horrible timing for a guy, you know, to get suspicion of murder thing right before the draft because he would have been a first round pick quite possibly the first round pick for the lions if it wasn't for that he'd be a first round pick the talent was there the big man from lsu everyone loved leo collins day one for sure at the very least he would have went in the second round and uh why not take the chance on him why not i know hindsight is 2020 but why not take the chance on a guy that has so much talent if he doesn't want to play for you, if it is, you know, the situation like he said, and he's not going to go ahead and sign because of drafting reasons and contracts and all that, well, you've just wasted a meager seventh round pick. You address the offensive line in the last round. Why not take the chance on a first round talent in Leo Collins? Imagine this offensive line, a young offensive line with Swanson, who eh, kind of question mark, but you've got Tomlinson who really looked good toward the end. Warford, who's already legit, you know, Reef kind of up and down, but Leo Collins into that mix, man, hindsight is 2020, but I wish the Lions would have took a risk on that move. It would have put them in a much better position, even going into this year, and you would have brought in a guy that uh, definitely a 53 man roster guy, more than likely your right tackle of the future. All right, guys, that's going to do it. This wasn't the explosion fireworks in terms of news for this week for the Lions. So I'm thinking things are going to get <laughs> things are going to get interesting this upcoming week. I'm expecting to hear something from Calvin. I'm expecting some more personnel shakeups. Whether it happens or not, we'll be back as always on the following Monday. Myself, Jerry Mallory, can be found on Twitter at Jerry Mallory NFL. I also do video contributions on pridedetroit.com I'm trying to be all over the place if it's Detroit Lions I'm trying to talk about them I'm trying to do videos on them thank you for listening to this uh, I want to thank the Detroit Sports Podcast for once again partnering up with me I can't thank uh, Doc and Jock enough for giving me this chance I love what I'm doing and the best is yet to come until next Monday we plan on having a guest or two on 
where we'll be talking about draft and Lions goodness. This has been Jerry Mallory for the Hindsight 20 Podcast. See you next week.